Hi everyone and welcome to another episode of Cybersecurity Sauna. Thanks for joining us for another session where we sweat out the hot topics in security. So welcome to all our listeners and be sure to follow us on Twitter at hashtag Cybersound. Cybersecurity is a hot topic during election seasons and various elections are being held in Europe this spring. As digitally enabled as the world is, shouldn't we all be voting electronically by now or via the internet? Here with us today to discuss why or why not are F-Secure's Tomi Tuominen and Antti Vähäsipilä. Welcome back to the show, guys. Thank you. Nice to be here. Thank you. So what's your relationship with electronic voting? I've spent five years of my life with e-voting. Uh, originally trying to secure a Finnish election pilot that was run uh, like back in early 2000 or so. Myself, I was uh, invited as an observer for the same pilot back in the day. Uh, then I've been a member of a internet voting working group for the respective ministry here in, in Finland. Let's put it this way that I, I've had the chance to think about these things, at least on the conceptual level. So there was a pilot for on e-voting in Finland in the early 2000s. Now what happened with the pilot? The pilot was uh, run as a uh, like an direct recording electronic voting at the polling places. So essentially you um, used the device to record your vote and then there was no paper trail of any sort. And I think that the uh, well, well, the re- result was in the end it was annulled, so it was declared invalid. And the main reason, if I re- uh, recall correctly, was a uh, user interface issue. So it was a bit unclear how uh, or when the uh, vote was actually recorded, and it was very slightly uh, different than the instructions actually led to believe so uh, in in a way it was not a security issue but it was kind of a design or user experience design issue for those of you unfamiliar with the finnish system in finland we usually vote on one thing at a time and uh, basically you get a list of candidates you pick the one you like you write their number on a piece of paper and drop that piece of paper in the ballot box So very simple. But this is not the case in all countries in Europe. There seems to be quite a variety of systems globally. And uh, if Finland would be on the far end of on, on the simplicity scale, so that, yes, usually a traditional ballot-based voting, we have a pencil that we use on a piece of paper. And in US, you have like a letter or letter page or or two or three pages of choices you have to make and you're voting everything from the file marshal to the presidential candidate or or so on so there is a huge difference between these systems when it comes to what is defined as a voting experience in general but we're also talking about two different things there's electronic voting as in the polling machine at the polling station And there's also internet voting. Yes, well, actually, I think that you could divide the e-voting into like three different categories. So there's internet voting, which is obviously also electronic voting, uh, unless you're using like carrier pigeons or something like that. And uh, then you've got so-called DRE or direct recording electronic uh, voting, which happens at the polling place. And it means that the ballot or vote is recorded ele- completely electronically. There's no paper trail. And then there is something called auditable paper trail or voter verified paper trail based electronic voting where, for example, complex ballots, which are re- very difficult to fill in, they can be displayed to the user using like a dynamic or interactive user interface, for example. And then the results will be stored both electronically and as a paper or it might also be only paper. With those machines, you can actually do two different counts. You can count the electronic votes, and then you can count the uh, paper votes as a backup if you want. It will produce a paper trail that can be audited. Then there are variations of all these things. So you have also optical devices. So basically you're submitting a paper-based thing, but it could be like a 
questionnaire where you're taking boxes and that is optically optically read and there has been issues with those kind of devices as well so you can fool the device to actually uh, give you kind of wrong votes it, although the original paper was in perfect shape although you might have a uh, paper audit trail you might also have an external device that is basically completely separated from the voting system but it's offering a digital audit trail so all the votes uh, that are being cast are recorded uh, you could think of it as a black box on an airplane um, and then there is of course a huge debate whether that is qualified as an as an audit trail or not because it's technically not a paper audit trail but it's more like an electronic audit trail but this is the reason why it's very hard to answer a question like is e-voting good or bad because you'd have to first understand the election type or the uh, referendum type what you're voting for and then also the types of machines countries also have differing standards on how well even in a traditional election they will, for example, retain the chain of custody of the ballot itself, for example. In some uh, countries, you will be able to drop the ballot uh, into a ballot box unsupervised. And in other countries, such as Finland, you are being supervised the whole whole way so that you cannot drop anything else into the ballot box, for example. Yeah, or several ballots or something. Uh, for example, yeah, ballot box stuffing uh, or anything like that, yeah. You guys have been involved in this conversation for 20 years now. What are some of the arguments for electronic voting? Why why are we having these conversations? Well, it depends on the type of electronic voting you're referring to. But I mean, there are a lot of different uh, reasons why you would want to bring e-voting into the picture. One of them is the thing that Tommy also already mentioned. So the uh, complexity of the ballot. So you can have a kind of easier and more interactive UI, a user, user interface that will guide the uh, voter through the choices. And probably that can decrease the number of like plain human errors that people are making when casting the ballot. So that's one key thing. How do you mean guide, like provide additional information? One of the key things is accessibility. So if you, for example, have poor eyesight and your ballot is very complicated and you have to fill in a optically read form, for example, like how to find the right dot that you mm. have to uh, pencil in. That's one, one thing that it's much easier to do that on a touch screen than okay. on a pencil. Also, you might just accidentally pick the wrong candidate if you you have to jot down a number. Uh, so it's it's much more the user experience when clicking on a face of somebody is much better than choosing a number, especially true for elderly people. And uh, and in countries where the literacy rate is not very high, so if you know the face or the symbol of the party, for example, then it's easier to show on a, on a screen potentially. Um, for internet voting specifically, that allows, for example, absentee voting um, easier than the sort of uh, physical votes. So if you have, for example, expatriates all around the world, so if you have a, a lot of your citizens uh, abroad who would need to travel to faraway embassies, for example, in order to vote, it's much easier if you can do it by uh, via the internet. What about things like voter turnout? That's often been quoted as a goal for countries to increase the voter turnout, to give the vote more legitimacy. I think that's the main reason. There, there has been a lot of discussion in general about these voting systems, but nobody's talking about the process. And it's still a very crucial part of the big picture. So if you go through the whole life cycle of voting, first you have to pick and choose the people who are allowed to vote. Then you need to have a way to tell them that, you, okay, now you're eligible uh, to vote. And uh, basically, it's your your civil right to do so, uh, and this is also already at this point there are huge differences. For for example, in the U.S., you have to register, mm -hmm. and in Finland, it's kind of given. Mm -hmm. If if you're over 18, you're allowed to vote. The whole the whole process should be looked at when we're talking about voting because there are so many places where it can go horribly wrong. Personally, I I think it's dangerous to look at this 
uh, in a very, very contained manner that, okay, it's the, the problem is the terminal or the problem is the, is the voting place or, or this specific thing. You have to have a very holistic view to this whole thing in order to make sure that it's actually solid. But if you zoom into the actual uh, process of an election, uh, then I'll just give you an example where like electronic voting may be both a benefit and a uh, something you don't want to have, for example. Let's assume that you have a country where you have like really far away places and you're going to do a ordinary polling place based vote. And uh, now if you ha are using traditional paper ballots, you're going to have to transport them from those faraway polling places to some place where they're being counted officially. And the chain of custody of those ballots is or may be very hard to ensure if you have to travel for a long journey through areas which may not be, for example, completely under government control. If you bring in an electronic aspect to that, you can, for example, transfer a backup copy or the only copy of the votes uh, or the ballots electronically, integrated, protected over a cellular connection, for example, which kind of fixes this one. But then it opens the other thing that what's the input to this process. So uh, it may be easier for the people at the polling place to detect ballot box stuffing, for example, so casting uh, extra ballots, but they m might not be able to detect that on a completely electronic machine. So when you go into the details, the, your solution may both solve problems and create new problems. And you've got to have a very good threat model in order to decide whether or not introduction of e-voting is beneficial to you or not. So you're talking about sort of electronic voting as a part of the whole voting process, and it involves many different steps. Um, I think typically what you see are schemes where you just replace the ballot, the ballot, the taking the ballot with an electronic version of it and keep sort of everything else in the process the same. Is that problematic? I mean, we've been using backend systems for voting as long as there has been computers. So it, it's, it's not that problem. The problem usually stems from the fact that you're trying to combine anonymity with strong authentication. Mm. And those two properties don't get along with each other too well. So you need to be able to verify that the voter is eligible to vote. And at the same time, nobody should know what that person has been voting, uh, voting for. And trying to replicate that functionality with computers is usually the part where it comes very, very problematic. Why is that? Because in the, the polling stations I'm used to going to, what they do is they sort of authenticate you when you get there. And uh, after that, like once you've sort of gained entry into the polling station, you get the paper ballot in your hand, then that's your authentication sort of from then on. That's your session token. Then you go in and, and write your number and you drop that piece of paper and only that piece of paper in the ballot box. And as long as the number of people who've been authenticated and who've cast their vote, empty or otherwise, uh, as long as those numbers match, there's no problem. In, in theory, yes. And that, that's basically the way how the pilot was done in Finland as well. Because uh, although you want to do the authentication or authorization, to be more precise, right. um, you want to do that in a, in a solid way, uh, you want to separate the actual authorization from the voting yeah. itself. Yeah. But it's still not, uh, you, you want to be able to pair the amount of votes with the people who voted. And you need a, some sort of mechanism to do that, uh, most, preferably almost real time. So is it harder to separate those two in like an electronic setting than it is in a real world setting? If you scale these problems, I mean, it was never a problem in Finland where there's only like 5 million Finns out of which at any given time, something like 2.5 million is allowed to vote. Yeah, It's not a problem here, but if you go to places where you have 200 million people, it might become an issue. Of course, this goes back to the legislation. So in Finland, if there is a discrepancy between 
the voters and the vote uh, casted votes, uh, the the result is null. So it's uh, you have to the statistics have to match. Mm. I I think that there are like two things that need to be ensured for each ballot that's cast. Uh, first, of course, the the thing that that Tommy said that nobody should be able to tell who voted and for whom. Or we can tell who voted, but not for whom. And then uh, the voters themselves shouldn't be able to prove that whom they voted for. So that the uh, selling and buying of votes won't become possible. Yeah, or you can't be coerced to vote one way for or example, other. For example, that, yes. So now, uh, in the physical system, with physical ballots and physical ballot boxes, the this problem is taken care of by physical means. So the shuffling of those ballots happens almost naturally when you uh, put it into a big ballot box and then you count the votes and they the votes themselves are like anonymous. So, well, there, there are very little that you can actually use to tag the votes to the voters. Now, in the uh, electronic systems, you have to do that in some other way. You have very nice uh, shuffling uh, methods using cryptography uh, that you can use. But there the point is that you cannot easily observe the shuffling. Also the phase where, I mean, at, at some point the system will know who you are and what are you voting for because the system authenticates you and then gets your vote. The separation of these two facts would have to be done in a way that's plausible. Mm. And now being able to prove that the separation actually works and the shuffling works properly, that's very difficult because you would have to prove that software and its actual deployment both work as intended. Yeah, I mean, in the physical setting, there's sort of almost like two layers of shuffling happening, like the the voters get their ballot slip and they go into the boxes and, and, and they fill out the person they like, so forth. So, like, not everybody takes the same amount of time. So the order in which they complete the voting is not the same as the order they came in as. And then the different votes end up like the the pieces of paper will fall in the ballot box and sort of get shuffled there automatically, like you said. Mm. Yes. We couldn't but, do but, that but in the electronic system. But I think the key key aspect here is that you can actually see this physical shuffling with your normal human senses, right. whereas you cannot observe a computer doing the cryptographic magic uh, with your own senses. You have to rely on observation of the source code, the compilation and the deployment and the execution environment of that code. Yeah, and especially trying to figure out if the shuffling is happening in a cryptographically sound manner is very For example, difficult. Yes, yeah. Yeah. And that, that pretty much brings me to the point, uh, that, is, that was my first ob observation when I started looking at e-voting. Ballot-based voting that is enabled or done with pen and paper is actually a brilliant way to do this. It, there are so many subtle things that it handles kind of automatically and when you're trying to move this on top of computers so that the computers will or basically deterministic machines are trying to handle the same tasks it is super complicated so what kind of things if we talk about ballot based voting done with pen and paper i can e explain it to anybody in five minutes even to my mom that is like 80 years old. And not only that, after that, she's able to verify with the skill set that, that she just learned within five minutes, she can verify that it actually works as expected. Mm -hmm. Now, if we go to, the, go to the stuff that AVS just spoke about, if you're doing some crypto magic stuff, there is like maybe 50 people on the planet who understand the intricate details of that stuff. Plus, you kind of want to keep those 50 people away from the polling stations. Yeah, more or less. Usually they, they are equipped with some other useful skills as well. So even if you were able to implement, design and implement an e-voting system that would it be, would be perfect in every mean imaginable or every feature imaginable, uh, it would be very, very difficult to audit. And that 
kind of brings its own set of issues to the supply chain of that computer system and how do you handle the complexities of there? How do you know that you're actually running the compiled code from that specific source tree and, and so on? So Because you have to be able to verify the whole thing every time, not just once. Yeah, that's different from a lot of the usual use cases for compiling computer code. Well, basically the, the same rules apply, but now we're talking about democracy and not just some programming language of the week type of hipster coding. Yes, yeah, so this is now uh, why the pap- auditable payable trail in e-voting systems is a great solution uh, for this. Because even if there was a problem with the systems, you can still always fall back to the paper trail. And now that we don't have in the internet voting. And that's the that's the issue and the main separation here. Another thing that became crystal clear during the pilot that if you don't have full control over the endpoints, uh, you're, you're you have lost. There there is nothing you can do. You can't win because there is simply too many ways how you can fool the system. So when you say full control of the endpoints, how full are we talking in the technology stack? So. Of course, it didn't, I mean, you have to draw your trust boundary somewhere or you have to put your trust boundary somewhere. But I'd say that you need to have full control of the hardware, mm. of all the firmware components or the middle layer uh, that come before the operating system itself. Uh, you need to have a specific, specifically tailored operating system, hopefully in a read-only mode that you can't do really any proper changes to it. So you have repeatability is once again the keyword so you, you can always make sure that you're running that exact specific version and also some runtime checks that it has not been altered after the deployment and and so on it when i mean full control i really mean full control so that's more than just slapping the voting app on your ipad most definitely So let's get an understanding of the problems with electronic voting. Why is electronic voting so hard to get right? This is mostly a trust issue. The parties and individuals who lost in an election have to be able to trust the result. Let's assume that we have a situation where, for example, the society is very much polarized. Uh, There are like a let's say, two factions of the citizenship that are mutually distrusting each other. And there's a huge amount of uh, uh, social media-based argumentation, let's put it this way, that tries to, tra- tries, like to, that. tries to blackmail the other, other side. And now you have an election and you lose. If you can point a finger towards a system that cannot be observed, or that or whose integrity is based on the opinion of a highly paid consultant for example are you not going to use that as a weapon in the in the uh, discussions that follow the election or not you have to have legitimacy for the result and that's the most that's the hardest problem i i agree with that um, just merely disrupting an election is very often enough if you can cast a doubt on it cast a doubt on, on, the, on the process, you pretty much win. So you don't even have to actually affect the election in no. any way, you just make people no. think you did. Exactly. On the other hand, I, I like to point out another way of looking at it where it's actually better to have um, an internet-based election than no election at all. So if you can also imagine a country or a region that might be occupied and the government in exile wants to hold a legitimate, meaningful election. The only way they can do that is by using internet elections. So again, here it's not black and white. What would be an example of an attack scenario against an electronic voting system? There are a few different scenarios how you can exploit the system if you have separated the authorization from the actual voting. Um, One of the ways is that you, you can actually register to multiple places and that allows you to cast multiple votes because the authentication or authorization register is not a single backend system. But of course, this is very, it depends how your 
your voting works, but that's a very legitimate threat. So you want to make sure that each and every voter is able to cast only one vote. One, one vote. So, but like, what's the nightmare scenario of electronic voting? Well, I guess the, the movie plot scenario would be that somebody who was not even part of the roster will actually win the election. Right. And then everybody will be just questioning, like, how did that even exactly. happen? Like, how can I trust any of the government institutions going forward? Who's behind this and all that? The key point with any voting system or, or a process is that you want basically full transparency, uh, but most importantly, repeatability. You can recount the votes. You can do all kinds of different checks and make sure that that the election was was a legit one. So there are a lot of countries out there who are using a form of electronic voting today. Um, are any of them even close to getting it right? There have been very interesting um, tries to get it right. Uh, for example, in Norway, based on a fully open source system, for example. But then again, Every country and every society has to make their own threat model sure. for what, they, what they're trusting and how much they are going to invest in that. Uh, because creating a fully transparent, open source based, repeatable, build based uh, internet voting system, for example, it's not cheap. And unlike normal elections, you need to maintain that also between the elections so that whenever the next round of iOS rolls around, your client will still work. So it's not just a trust issue, it's also a economical and financial issue for those countries that are taking that into use. In some, some uh, countries or areas, the, um, the elections are uh, being held or Uh, referendums are being held on, I'm not saying more trivial matters, but more often than in some other countries. Some countries like Finland, they only have a general election once in a while, and then those people who have been uh, elected usually do the decisions. We do have the idea of indicative referendums as well, but they, those are very rarely used because mostly of the costs involved, I guess. Uh, but there are some other areas where you have these referendums and indicative referendums much more often. But and would that be better for democracy? I'd, I have, I'd have my voting app on my phone and I would get like referendums every 15 minutes and I could sort of just select the topics I want to weigh in on and, and, and vote. That's a very good question. Should we ask the citizenship more about things that they they really want there is one good thing in representative democracy and that's the fact that like you are not going to fix your own shoes nowadays and you're not necessarily going to paint your own house you're going to contract it out somebody who does it for a living the politicians like it or not they uh, make a living out of actually tracking all the things that go into a complex decision If you need to distill something into a very simple question to the citizenship, uh, that runs the risks of being really polarizing and dumping things down. Mm. So it's not necessarily a good thing to ask everything from the citizenship who doesn't have the time to spend on understanding the intricacies of things. Winston Churchill once said that the best counter argument against democracy is to speak to a voter. He also said that democracy is the worst system of government out there except for everything else. Yeah, that's that's true. If we go back to the original question, I personally think that at, at least it's, at least this is true for Finland and I would say for most of the smaller countries e-voting is actually trying to solve an issue that we don't have. I mean, what would be the benefit of having e-voting? I I would really like to hear what that benefit is. Even nowadays, I mean, the, the voting places close their doors at eight o'clock and we have the preliminary results within a few hours. And it's it's a show of its own. And 
the final results take like three or four hours to complete. So how much faster does that has to be? No, but now I have to like get out of my house and go to a polling station to cast my vote. And it's like this whole hassle. Once every six years yeah. or so. Yeah. You need some fresh air. <laughs> I absolutely do. So do you envision that there ever will be a day when most people will just sit at home and vote online via the internet? Is that ever going to be the case? It might be the case for some of the stuff. I, I still feel that like parliamentary votes or, or like voting for president or the, those kind of things should not be done remotely. Then again, for example, um, things like deciding on where the city should build new buildings, for example, uh, that's not a th question you can put to vote necessarily, but you can collect the citizens' opinions on that. For example, our hometown, Helsinki here, uh, does a really, really good job in actually asking for residents' opinions. That's done over the internet. That's not polling, but that citizen participation. You, you, can, you can do a lot more citizen participation on the grassroots level without having to go for the uh, problems involved in, in elections or actual balloting. So I could foresee a thing where people spend their uh, evenings on, on the couch commenting on things that are close to them, like mm. uh, in the neighborhood and everything else, and uh, providing opinions and information for sort everybody's to benefit. Inf to inform the decision makers. Exactly. But like security experts have fixed a lot of really complex issues in the past. So is there something about electronic voting that makes it like just a problem too complex to be solved by the best and the brightest. When I started looking at it, after three months, I was pretty sure that this is a bad idea. After six months, I was completely sure that this is the most idiotic thing on the planet. And after that, the rest of the time, I more or less just tried to make sure that this insanity doesn't go forward. Just because it's fixing a problem that we don't have. And not only that, but also, like the things that we already covered earlier, that, that the requirements of trying to combine things that are not really combinable. I don't know if that's even a word, but the transparency, the repeatability, a strong authentication, anonymity, uh, those kind of things, they're, they're attributes that don't get along that well. Plus, these are things that we struggle with in other applications as well. Pe people underestimate how hard it is. Yeah. It's not evident. It, it's it's one of those things that you look at it, they're like, ah, this is a solved problem. It, it's not. I, I'd i like to see that we first solve a few other issues before we try to tackle this one. Every time there's a conversation about electronic voting, you just wait a couple of seconds and somebody comes in and says, what about blockchain? Maybe using blockchains will solve all e-voting issues. Yeah, I saw a picture on the internet related to one election where the ballot box, the physical ballot box, was chained to a block of concrete. That was a nice implementation of blockchain in elections. But yes, uh, whenever you are raising the the uh, concept of a blockchain, I, I think that it would be intellectually honest to also provide the details of what you're talking about. Uh, I mean, is it a public or private blockchain? Who owns the nodes? Where does the software come from? What's the consensus algorithm? And after that, we can start actually discussing the merits of that specific implementation of the blockchain for anything. Uh, so not all blockchains are equal? Not all blockchains are the same and not necessarily usable for the purposes that we want to use them for. So you have to give the parameters for that. The other thing is that um, if you are going to put uh, the ballots on the blockchain, depending on, of course, your design of the election blockchain, if you're going to put the ballots on the blockchain, you're probably going to encrypt them if the blockchain is public. And if the ballots are containing also the information about the voter, then if it's a public blockchain, there will be copies of the blockchain 
indefinitely because because of the nature of information it gets copied. Uh, so the encryption also has to hold for the duration of those copies of blockchain. So oh. if the copies of the blockchain are indefinitely being stored somewhere in order to keep who voted for whom as a secret, then the encryption also has to hold for so, that time. So otherwise you could go back to elections like a couple of decades ago and, and crack them with modern means and, and right. find out what happened. Right. For example, that. That's already an issue because many of the voting systems are actually storing the encrypted ballot boxes. And if you can repeat or or kind of revert the shuffling process, it actually allows you to see who voted who. And that's a big issue. Absolutely. So you guys started off saying it's hard to say if electronic voting is a good thing or a bad thing, but... I think, Tom, you summarized it pretty nicely when you said maybe there's a couple of other issues that we need to take a whack at before we dive into the pool that is electronic voting. But I'll say that if you if your countries or areas benefits and your specific threat model and problems, uh, for example, make it make a, make internet voting a better choice for you, then you can obviously make that decision. I mean, if, if internet voting is the only way you can have a legitimate and meaningful vote because you just can't do the uh, traditional voting, then the net result is that you should be doing internet voting. This is the same as in any type of security. Se- not security for its own sake, but it has to always to be a business decision. And here the business decision is the, the well-being of the citizenship or the residents that you have in your area. I definitely agree. So this is this is not one of those one size fits all type of products or or services. So it really depends on your use case if it's a good solution for you or not. Well there we go. On those words, thank you for being on the show. Thank you. Thank you. That was our show for today. I hope you enjoyed it. Make sure you subscribe to the podcast and you can reach us with questions and comments on Twitter through FSecure with the hashtag Cybersound. Thanks for listening.